Hi, good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Scott Stephen Havelka. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the deputy director of the Loft LGBTQ Plus Community Center located in White Plains, Westchester County, New York. It is June 30th, the last day of June Pride Month. And what an amazing program the Loft and Arts Westchester have planned for tonight, the Art of Lip Sync. And for the last time in 2021, I want to wish all of you joining us here on Zoom a happy Pride for those joining us viewing on Facebook, happy Pride. And for those of you who are local to us, happy Westchester Pride. It was earlier this month when we began that the law partnered with the County Executive's Office, George Latimer, to paint the Progress Pride flag at the historic Playland Amusement Park. We designed a beautiful mural at the entrance of the park, as well as raised two Progress Pride flags above the park entrance for the first time ever at Playland. Just think how amazing it is for those families and young people who come to Playland to feel recognized and to feel welcomed. And in case you weren't aware, the Progress Pride flag is an is a update to our traditional rainbow flag, which includes the colors for the transgender communities of pink, blue, and white, and includes brown for the LGBTQ plus communities of color, and includes black to honor those who we have lost to HIV AIDS. You can see a very cool time-lapse of the painting of that mural on the Loft's website, loftgaycenter.org. Throughout the month, the Loft has held over 30 programs for Westchester Pride, both virtual and in-person, large and small for families with children and seniors. And last week, we collaborated with Arts Westchester for our very, very entertaining discussion on the evolution of the ballroom scene with some up and coming ballroom performers as well as some ballroom legends. If you did not see that, that uh, panel discussion, you can catch it on Art Specialist's Facebook page and check it out. And it's highly, highly worth it. We are reminded today that pride continues year round and there is so much work to be done to achieve true equity within our diverse LGBTQ plus communities. Soon we'll be posting on our Loft website details on a phone bank that we are organizing in July for the passage of the Federal Equality Act. There is still a lot of work to be done both at the local, state and federal levels. We'll also be posting uh, details on our website about the Loft Center's reopening our physical campus so that we can safely still have in-person groups and events happening at the center, as well as maintaining a virtual campus for those individuals who have found us during this past year and a half, or who cannot travel to the center or physically don't have an LGBTQ center uh, close to where they live. I am excited for what's in store in the future, but I'm equally excited for our program tonight. And I want to invite my partner in organizing this event at Arts Westchester, Aaron Page. Aaron. Hi, Scott. Thank you uh, so much, Scott, for um, all the work that you do and the work that the Loft does, which is, which is so uh, critical to our Westchester community. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron Page. I'm the Director of Folk and Traditional Arts at Arts Westchester the officially designated Arts Council for Westchester County. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our 2021 Westchester Pride Queer Arts Series, presented by Arts Westchester's Folk Arts Program and the Loft LGBTQ Plus Center. This is the third year that Arts Westchester has been working with the Loft to create LGBTQ Plus folk and traditional arts programming. And I have to say that we're so thankful for this partnership. Um, I'd like to extend a very special thank you this evening to the one and only legendary John Epperson, aka Lipsinka, and to Max Pleasure for collaborating with us, Arts Westchester and The Loft, in organizing and designing tonight's program. The Art of Lipsync is made possible by Etain, 
New York's only family-run, women-owned, and operated medical marijuana company. The program is also made possible in part by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. It is my honor and a pleasure to introduce the moderator of tonight's program, Max Pleasure. Max Pleasure is a New York City-based drag king and YouTuber. He was voted the Brooklyn Drag King of the Year in 2018 and inspired the short documentary, Max, which was a Vimeo staff pick and selection of New York's LGBTQ film festival, Newfest. He has graced the stages of RuPaul's Drag Race season nine winner, Sasha Velour's Nightgowns, Bushwig, the Austin International Drag Festival, NYFW, and more. He was also the featured drag, ki drag king of Bubbly Waters hashtag Drag for All Flavors 2020 Pride campaign. Max currently performs in virtual drag shows and has his own YouTube channel, which he uses to educate the general population about drag kings, provide tips to new drag performers, and to uplift the voices of fellow community members on important topics. Thank you so much, Max, for being here tonight. And I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron, for that introduction. Hi, everybody. I'm Max Pleasure. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I am so excited to be closing out Pride Month with a discussion on a art form that I am very passionate about. And I am honored to be doing so with a pioneer in the art field. Um, John Epperson, AKA Lipsinka, is legendary. Um, since Lipsinka first hit the nightlife scene in the 1980s, she's ascended to much bigger and way brighter stages, including Joan Rivers' very own soundstage and Terry Mugler's catwalk. Um, she's thrilled audiences from her own stage with shows like Lipsinka, A Day in the Life, um, the Passion of the Crawford, and John Epperson Show Trash, and many, many more. <laughs> but only occasionally has Lipsinka or John used his own voice as Lipsinka. Um, Lipsinka is famous for her meticulously edited soundtracks featuring audio clips from the likes of Joan Crawford and other silver screen divas. Um, Often, especially for her own shows, Lipsinka does this as a full length feature. Um, it's truly incredible the work that she does. Um, and she was one of the first drag performers to do it that way. Um, it's truly um, a joy to get to talk with her this evening, to talk with John this evening. And um, why don't we share a little um, sizzle reel? superstardom as women, recording artists, fashion models, and movie stars who cross-dress for success. My first guest is an international star you've seen her featured in Gap ads, in an HBO special, and in George Michael's Too Funky video. Just last year, she was included in Esquire's list of the women we love. Please welcome the fabulous Lip Synca. <laughs> Oh, it's always a pleasure for me to visit with you each. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. I want to speak to Mrs. Janie Clarkson, please. Hello. 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 He's on the line. Let me speak to him. Mr. Liggett, I didn't think you'd be foolish enough to call today after last night, but since you have, face it, I was the slut of all time. You will be gone soon, and I'll be glad. I 
wasn't being vicious, was I? Hello. Hello. <gasps> Barbara, please. Please, Barbara. Leave us alone, Barbara. If you need anything, ask Carol Ann. Hello. Hello, Cheney. <laughs> it's me. You didn't. You didn't. Why don't you die? Ladies and gentlemen, making her Broadway debut, the fabulous Liv Sinka. Thank you very much. Everyone, please welcome John Epperson. On mute. There, I did it. Hi. Is it working? Yes. yes. <laughs> Hi. I'm very excited to talk with you this evening, and I hope you're staying cool where you are. Oh, well, you can see my air conditioner in the background. It's pretty hot in New York City. It is, it definitely is. So we're here to talk about the art of the lip sync. Of course, um, an art form that you are uh, very proficient in. <laughs> um, and I guess a great place to start off is to ask how you found that passion for lip syncing and like where your interest in it first came from. Well, my first interest was when I was a kid. Uh, my older sisters would lip sync to a record that my father had. He had this album called For Men Only that had a picture of Jane Mansfield on the cover wearing a, a skin tight black cat suit on all fours, looking up at the camera. Now, mind you, Jane Mansfield didn't sing on the recording. Jane Mansfield was not much of a singer, but Jane Mansfield appeared on a lot of record album covers in the 50s. And the songs on the, on the album were covers of popular tunes and Broadway tunes in the 50s. And my sisters were older than me. Uh, I say were because one of my sisters has deceased now, but, uh, and, and that deceased sister who was the oldest of the two was always finding things for us to do. She was very good at that. And she discovered that she and my other sister could move their mouth to the recordings on this for men only record. I wish I had the record here to show you, I don't, it's not, Way it's in here somewhere. You here can it find is. it on you. Here's the there record. <laughs> How in the world did you get that? The power of Google. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you just found it. Very good. So the two of them would lip sync to, just to amuse me and my mother. I was too little. So my mother and I were the audience. And uh, Max, now your image is small. How can I see you big again, I wonder? I think you need to say something. Okay. There you are. Okay, okay great. <laughs> be better. Um, so we were the audience and my mother didn't call it lip syncing. My sisters didn't know what to call it. My mother called it pantomime. And then I remember being at a family reunion and mimicking my sisters and pretending that I was singing a record that was playing at this family reunion and everyone gathered around to watch me and applaud and laugh. And it was, it was I was being noticed. I, I was thrilled that I was being noticed. And you know, at the end of the show, Gypsy, and at the end of the movie, Gypsy asks her mother, why did you do it, Mama? And Rose says, I guess I just wanted to be noticed. Well, I think that's a universal truth. We all want to be noticed, mm -hmm. whether it's our boss telling us we did a good job at work, 
but I wanted to really be noticed. And that was a way to really be noticed. Well, I didn't, I didn't follow up on that. Uh, but I, when I got to college, I went to my first gay bar. I saw my first drag show. It was a troupe from Memphis. Now, I was in Jackson, Mississippi in college, not far from where I grew up, south of Jackson. But this was a troupe from Memphis who showed up to perform at this gay bar in Jackson, Mississippi. And I was so frightened by them. I think because I saw my future. And, and because the patriarchy had been drummed into me and, and fear of homosexuality and all of that, it was a frightening, frightening experience. But I do remember that one of them called himself Bell Star and he wore a full poodle skirt, like from the fifties, had a big poodle on it, applique. And one of the others, I don't remember what his drag name was, but I remember he liked to be introduced as the only perambulating mouseketeer. Now, Max, that may not mean anything to you because you may be too young to know what a mouseketeer was, but... I, I do, actually. You know? I do know what a mouseketeer is okay. <laughs> or was. But we should tell the audience in case they don't know. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was a Disney invention. It was a bunch of kids and there was a TV show and they showed Mickey Mouse cartoons and they also did their own performances, these Mouseketeers. Annette Funicello, who became a big movie star in the Beach Party movies was a Mouseketeer. And Bobby Burgess, who was, became the dancer on the Lawrence Wilk show was a Mouseketeer. So it was a jumping off place in show business for some people. But this guy ended up in the drag business in Memphis. And I think he really had been a Mouseketeer, but it's so funny that he called himself the only perambulating Mouseketeer. Now, mind you, I was 17 or 18 when I saw this guy, so I didn't even know what the word perambulating meant. It wasn't until later that I found it meant walking and standing, which makes it even funnier that he called himself the only walking and standing out there. <laughs> so I was so frightened by this troupe from Memphis that I didn't go back to that bar for a year or more. Mm -hmm. But in that intervening year, I discovered, I found out about Ionesco and the Theater of the Absurd. And I found out about Charles Ludlam and the Theater of the Ridiculous. And I made a new friend who went to a college near mine in Jackson. And he was a very flamboyant guy. And I had seen him on stage at the college where he was going to school. And we made friends and he asked me if I had been to see the drag shows in town. And I said, yes, I did go. And it scared me so much that I don't want to see it again. And he said, oh, but you must go because not only is it in a different place and a better place for a show, but he said, it's theater. Would you see, I hadn't thought of it as theater. I just saw the stigma attached to it. So I went with new eyes and I began to think, yes, this is absurd theater. This is ridiculous theater, if you want to perceive it that way. Mm -hmm. I still didn't want to perform in drag in Jackson because of the stigma attached to that in that place at that time. But it did occur to me that if you go to New York, you could call walking down the street art if you wanted to. <laughs> Very true. And I saw Charles Ludlam, who was doing his production of Camille, I saw him in Time or Newsweek magazine. And 
I thought, well, how do you get in Time Magazine? I want to be in Time Magazine. And then I realized, oh, well, if you go to New York, that might happen. And if you get in drag in New York, that might happen. It's happened for this man. So that's when I started plotting, how could I get to New York? I still wasn't thinking about lip syncing, however. Mm -hmm. The thing that got me interested in lip syncing was, uh, well, I'm gonna skip over a lot of details, but I moved to New York in 1978. Mm -hmm. And I made my living by playing the piano for ballet classes all over the city. But the place I had my eye on was American Ballet Theater because they had a star there. <clears throat> Excuse me, they had a star there who I was very interested in named Gilsey Kirkland. And uh, I had seen her on television twice. And a movie had come out called The Turning Point that used dancers from American Ballet Theater. So I wanted to get a job with them. And I took me two years, but then I got a full-time job with them. That started in late summer of 1980. And we worked that whole season through, uh, it ended the climax of the, that season was uh, eight weeks at the Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center. And then I went with a small group of dancers to Europe, which is a fantastic trip. I won't go into the details of that, but it's, it was a fantastic trip. And at the end of that trip, I was on my own and there I was in Europe. And so I went to Paris on my own and I had found out about a club there called Michou. And if you want to look it up, it's spelled M-I-C-H-O-U. And Michou was a real person. He died not long ago. I think the club is closed for now because of the pandemic, but I believe they intend to reopen it. And at Michu, there were several waiters, but our waiter, he took our order and the food arrived. And 45 minutes later, he was on stage as Liza Minnelli, as Sophia Loren, as Zizi Jomer, the music hall star in France, as Josephine Baker, the music hall star in France. And he was lip syncing. They were all lip syncing. Most of them were doing celebrity impersonations, lip syncing. There was one who was heavy set and he lip synced to an opera recording and he had created his own character. He looked quite a bit like he was lip syncing to opera and he was doing it for laughs. He was a comic. Um. me that they were much better at lip syncing than the uh, people I had seen in Mississippi. So that's what started me thinking, hmm, maybe I could do this. Mm -hmm. If it's a matter of timing, that shouldn't be a problem for me. I'm a trained musician. And so I just decided I could do it. I've seen one of your videos and you have analyzed a lot of lip syncing. I have to confess, I have not done that. I've, I think some of the things that you could verbalize, I just decided I can do it intuitively. Yeah, and I think that's like, that's a big part of it, just deciding you can do it and trying it with confidence. Like that magic power within, that I think is like the big, that's what makes a good lip sync a good lip sync, you know? <laughs> well, you know, growing up, going to the movies and seeing musicals like Gypsy who, that I mentioned earlier, or any Judy Garland movie, or any Barbra Streisand movie, they are lip syncing for the most part mm -hmm. because of how the technology works with the camera. And so as it turned out, we 
we had been looking at lip syncing all our lives and we didn't even know it. And then along came MTV and everyone on MTV in their early eighties when MTV first started up and they were showing music video, like Billy Idol videos. So he was lip syncing. Mm -hmm. Madonna was lip syncing in all of her music videos. It's always been there. It's just that I decided to really put it in people's face and say, this is what I'm doing. And the name Lip Synca tells you what I'm doing and hopefully tells you that I think it's an absurd act, mm -hmm. that I have a sense of humor about it. Mm -hmm. And that definitely comes through. I mean, even beyond just how you lip sync, how you move your mouth, the your physicality and the choreography that we saw in some of those clips that accompanies the different audio that you're working with, like that does show theatricality and comedy and like, yeah, it really, it's, um, it definitely shows, it shows well, approaching it that way. You, I, I guess I'm blessed to be an actor because not every drag performer perhaps is an actor but i have that gift now i am i do feel often like i'm hiding behind other people's voices and there there is <clears throat> there is a kind of dark side uh to all of this because i knew i knew that I wasn't trained to be an actor. I didn't know how to go about having a traditional career as an actor. And so it occurred to me, this is a way to be on stage and yet hiding behind a facade, the facade of someone else's voice, the facade of makeup, the facade of drag. I came to believe that that was not a particularly healthy thing for me. And that's why I started venturing out, doing other things and doing, keeping the brand name Lip Synca, but speaking with my own voice, doing performances as John Epperson, because I felt I was limiting myself. And I believe people still think I am uh, someone who gets in drag and lip syncs and that's all I can do. It isn't all I can do, but it's the thing I'm most known for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't want you to get trapped. Yeah. I don't want anyone to get trapped because I have said in the past that drag is one trap and then lip syncing is another trap inside that trap. Mm. I can see that. I've I've spoken to drag performers who feel similarly that they want to venture out and do different things just because I mean lip syncing and doing drag it's definitely a skill that you can hone get better at over time which I do want to ask you about but it is it can feel a little limiting sometimes especially when you're wearing high heels and cinching yourself up in a corset for most hours of the night <laughs> it can feel yeah. a little limiting. And look how little RuPaul gets in drag. Very true. Because he, he wants, also he doesn't even he wants people okay. to know that he can do other things. Mm -hmm. That's true. That is true. Um, but a question that I wanted to ask you: Once you decided that lip syncing was something that you that you could see yourself doing, and once you started doing it. Did you approach it like a skill that needed to be practiced? Like one, like how you would practice piano? Was lip syncing something you would spend time honing and practicing? Yes, I think so. But I think mostly I spent time on staging myself, the choreography mm -hmm. and trying to keep it visually interesting by moving around quite a bit. I kind of took my cue from Bette Midler and Joan Rivers, actually. In that, in that clip you showed, Joan is sitting still, but in Joan's nightclub act, you know, her comedy act, she never stopped. She was always back and forth on the stage. And Bette 
was the same way, even if it happened to be in a wheelchair. She was never, she hardly ever stopped moving unless it was a dramatic song she was singing. Mm -hmm. So I kind of took my cue from them to make sure that I was always moving unless the moment called for standing still. I didn't, I don't know that I looked in the mirror that much to examine my lip syncing. Mm -hmm. But I certainly knew it was important to be precise and to have it very well memorized. Uh, I have enjoyed, uh, I won't say the name, but, but I used to know someone who lip synced occasionally. Often she wouldn't know the words and she'd, she'd put her hand over her mouth. <laughs> in a decorative way, but she wasn't really fooling anyone. Yeah, or there's the- It's there's important the to know the lyrics. It definitely is. There's also the trick of doing a lot of spins, walking to the back of the stage with your back facing the audience at the parts that you don't know. Yeah, These performers, we, we stay tricky. Um, but you mentioned that- I Sorry, I just- a couple of times there's been this image that's a, this on my screen that said your internet connection is unstable. Am I, am I coming through okay for you? You're coming through. There's a few moments where there's a little bit of lag, but your audio does still come through. Like I get what your, some words I don't get, but I do get most of them. Uh, it, it looks like I'm lip syncing badly. Is that what yeah. it looks like? <laughs> <laughs> only, it's only a little bit. But I wanted to ask, so you mentioned Joan Rivers and Bette Midler being inspiration for the way that you move about the stage. Are there specific inspirations that um, affected the way, maybe your look or the way that you lip synced? Oh, well, hmm. The way that I lip synced, uh, other than, remembering how good I thought those performers were in Paris, I can't say that. Mm -hmm. Although as the years went by and I started looking at Judy Garland's movies even closer, she was a really good lip syncer, Judy Garland, very good lip syncer. Uh, there were other people in the movies who were good at it too, but she, she really knew how to nail it. But um, the look that I was going for was kind of a cross between Dovima, who was a fashion model in the 50s who had very severe eyebrows, and uh, a woman named Dolores Gray, who was a, made a few movies at MGM in the 50s. I'm a movie buff, and in New York, when I moved to New York in 78, uh, there was hardly any home video at all or any cable TV. And if you wanted to go to the movies, you had to go out to the movies. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of movies to see, a lot of places that were showing movies. And one of the best revival houses was called the Regency. It had been a neighborhood movie house years earlier, but it had become a revival house. It was uh, just north of Lincoln Center on Broadway, mm -hmm. around 67th Street. And they showed very good prints of old movies, it's practically a different double feature every two days. And it was my temple. I was there all the time and I wanted to see all the MGM musicals. And so there was a movie that I had never seen that they were showing called It's Always Fair Weather starring Gene Kelly and Sid Charisse. And they were the stars that I went to see, but up popped this woman I had never heard of in the middle of that movie named Dolores Gray. And she had a big, beautiful voice and big gestures and a big personality and she was very glamorous and I thought to myself 
there are drag performers who impersonate Cher, or they impersonate uh, Mae West or Liza Minnelli or Barbra Streisand or Judy Garland or on, Ethel Merman, on and on and on. But I am going to impersonate this woman. I'm going to impersonate this woman who is not so familiar to people. And that's where I, one of the bases where I started was just seeing her with her big personality. And then I started finding her records and I started using those records on stage. And uh, ultimately I got to know her a little bit. And, uh, I think I met her in 1990 and uh, went to her home and we went out for an evening together. And sometimes I would speak with her on the phone and she was a very nice lady and she still had that big personality and she could still sing. And she lived at 200 East 57th Street. And Kay Thompson was still alive at the time. Kay Thompson, who was Liza Minnelli's godmother, who also had a big loud voice. And Kay Thompson lived at 300 East 57th Street, only a block from Dolores. And I used to joke that I was gonna to move to 249 East 57th Street with a pair of binoculars and watch the two of them come and go from their apartment buildings. And now they're both gone. Mm -hmm. I have to say Kay Thompson was probably a big influence also because uh, I was very tall, I am tall and I was very skinny and Kay Thompson was not tall, but she looked tall and she was very skinny. And if you've ever seen the movie Funny Face, she's the editor of the magazine. I, you can't really see my arms and hands, but <laughs> I'm doing Kay Thompson right now. I um, Something that you said about, um... You said the first, oh, being influenced by fashion models um, reminded me of a clip that we have on hand, which I think would be great to share um, from the Terry Mugler catwalk in 1992. I don't know, Erin, can you roll that clip for us? There'll be a change in the world and a change in the sea. that video on YouTube and one of the comments is like you look like a fashion drawing and you really do especially the shapes of those costumes and also the um, the dramatic eyebrow you mentioned 
a, and a great performance as well, of course. <laughs> well, thank you. It's that is from VHS, and that's why the quality is not high definition. I wish I had a a better quality to put on YouTube, but as you said, it's from 1992, and that's <laughs> the best that I could get. <laughs> that is Dolores Gray singing. Oh, I didn't realize that. That is Dolores Gray singing. And I'm sitting here watching it just now and thinking, she never saw this. It's a terrible pity that she didn't get to. Now she did see me on stage and she did see me lip syncing to her, but she'd never saw that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think she would have been amused by it. When Dolores died, her family asked me to speak at her memorial service, which was nice. So I, I guess she was okay with me. Yeah, I guess she wasn't insulted by the by the impressions that she may have heard about. <laughs> um, I did want to ask. So, have have I don't know if you have um, kept up with the current drag scene in New York City, the new iterations of wig stock that's called Bushwig. I'm curious if you have kept up with that or seen any drag performers recently. Do you see a difference in the way that performers approach lip syncing from when you first started to now? Oh, well, the first part of your question, I have not kept up that much. Um, I The only thing that I've seen was uh, at uh, nightgowns. I performed at nightgowns two or three times myself. And even then, I was just mostly in the dressing room waiting to go on. So I didn't get to see what other people were doing. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Sasha perform before? I have, I have seen Sasha perform and, and Sasha and I did, a, a, I don't know what you'd call it, a, a dual conversation at DragCon in 2018. Mm -hmm. I can't remember now what they called that, but it was, I'm calling it a, a conversation. Mm -hmm. and I, I saw, and I saw Smoke and Mirrors, which I enjoyed very much. And, and Sasha has always credited me as an inspiration the way I have tried to credit Dolores or Charles Pierce or Charles Ludlam. And uh, I don't think I mentioned, uh, have you ever seen a movie called Outrageous with Craig Russell from 1977? Mm -mm. It's on YouTube and it doesn't cost anything to see it. I recommend it. I think it's the best feature film still about the life of a drag performer. Now, mind you, it was a different time and he was a celebrity impersonator, but he didn't lip sync. He sang with his own voice. He was a very good singer. And so I recommend that to you and to all the people watching. I hope there are people watching. <laughs> yeah, I've written that down now to check out Outrageous on YouTube. But I ask about Sasha because I see, I mean, I've heard her say before that you are an influence, that she's very inspired by your work. But I also see in the technique as well, I see some similarities. I don't know if, I mean, it's different trying to spot your own techniques in another person, but I definitely see some of you in her. Yes, I think that's probably true. Mm -hmm. uh... I don't know how much Sasha saw me perform live before we met. Maybe, maybe not at all. I don't know. But um, I don't know why, but I guess thinking about smoke and mirrors occurred to me. Another secret, to, if you want to give away a secret to the audience about lip syncing is, well, I got very spoiled because my career really got started at the Pyramid Club. And uh, the, the tech people at the Pyramid Club were 
they wanted the sound to be good. They were, it was important to them that the sound be good. And Lady Bunny and I have spoken about this over the years, that because we got spoiled, because those technicians at the pyramid wanted the sound to be so good that we had really good sound that we could hear on stage. Mm -hmm. The audio monitors at the foot of the stage that were facing us were always excellent. The sound was always really loud. And so we could hear what we were lip syncing to. And it does make all the difference in the world. You know, I started then performing at other places and the sound wasn't as good. And the sound, tech, the sound was not as important to the technicians as it was to the technicians at the Pyramid Club. And I'm still particular about that. And I think sometimes technicians get frustrated with me because they don't understand how important it is to me. But it's important even to a singer to be able to hear yourself because if you can't hear yourself, like uh, let's say Barbara Streisand in a concert, she wants to hear herself so that prevents her from pushing too hard. Mm -hmm. The only singers I can think who don't need an audio monitor facing back at them are opera singers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is the, would you say the secret is to, um, is to always get good audio from the sound guys? As best you can. Yeah. And, and then that you know the audience then the audience comes in and the audience eats up sound. So what you did in your tech rehearsal and you thought it was plenty loud enough, and then the audience is eating up the sound and you realize, oh, it needs to be even louder. So I always tell them at the sound check, if it needs to be even louder, I'm gonna give you a signal. And my signal that I need more sound, and some of them remember to look for it and some of them don't, is that I do this like Carol Burnett. I pull my right earlobe. Now, sometimes the sound can be too loud and uh, the signal for that is I play with my cleavage. <laughs> but then they may turn it down too soft or they may turn it down too quickly because it, it needs to be smooth. There's all these little mm -hmm. details that have to be finessed. It's one of the reasons I don't like doing one one off appearances that much anymore because you don't know what you're going to get. I prefer to work in the theater. It's a controlled environment. You can test it. You have a preview period where you can test everything mm -hmm. and then the reviewers don't see it until after you've tested everything. But it's not always, you're not always that lucky. Yeah, especially in the in the drag scene with the stages on dive bars that I frequent. Yeah, you know, if, if you're performing on top of a pool table, you may not have an audio monitor. <laughs> very, very true. Um, one of the questions that the loft in Arts Westchester wanted to make sure that I ask you about is a little bit more about advice. Are there any, you know I like a good do's and don'ts if you saw my YouTube video. Are there any do's and don'ts that if someone was like, please like tell me your secrets, please give me advice on lip syncing. What are the do's and don'ts that you would share? Well, like I said, I think I said earlier, I was a trained musician. So that was a big do in my favor right there. And even, even lip syncing to spoken word, I think of as music. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a pause, I count it in my head. You know, the audience doesn't know that I'm counting, but I'm counting. So, but not everyone is a musician. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is a trained musician. Not everyone is musical. So I'm trying to think of something that can, that everyone can use as a do. I mean, making sure you have good sound, making sure mm -hmm. you're rehearsed well. 
Mm -hmm. Pick something that's not too difficult. What a second, you know, I'm seeing people say, you know, people are saying things. Can you see that? Someone just said, wow, that's amazing. Yes, the phrasing and musicality of everyday speech. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's a very good point. Like um, how you were saying, um, approaching the spoken word audio as if it's music as well. Um, but another do for sure is learn the words. <laughs> right, learn the words. <laughs> or know one of the clever tricks. Do you know who Michael Musto is? I do not. Michael Musto had a very powerful column in the Village Voice for a long time called La Dolce Musto. And uh, now that the Village Voice is coming back four times a year, I think Michael's column is back. Uh, he he wanted to do a little story about me in his column and we did it over the phone and he said to me what do you think makes you different than other drag performers and i think i realized oh that's a trap but <laughs> but i was trying to be polite about it and serious about it and i said I rehearse a lot and I went on to say some other things. I don't remember now what I said. And all Michael quoted of me saying was, I rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> the implication was that other drag performers don't. I don't know that that's true, but, but the do is rehearse. Don't just get up there and do it. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, the joke is that you're doing messy drag. And there is an there used to be an audience for that. I enjoyed watching it myself. What used to be called trash drag, I think. And there were performers at the Pyramid Club who just threw it up there. And they didn't really rehearse they weren't meticulous they weren't all they weren't lip syncing necessarily either sometimes they mm -hmm. were sometimes they weren't but they were very funny in their inability or their obviousness that they hadn't tried that hard because it was trash drag right that was very funny but unless you're very good at being bad if you're very unless you're very good at trash drag i suggest you rehearse also i think a point of view is important i think a sense of humor is important mm -hmm. um when i first started seeing drag performers in mississippi after that troupe in memphis that i mentioned to you I began to realize there were lots of different types. There were, there were pageant queens who were very serious and their main raison d'etre was to look pretty in a gown. And they would just stand still and they would lip sync to Dionne Warwick, let's say, doing the theme from Valley of the Dolls. To me, that wasn't that interesting. Then there, were, there was another one, another performer there who called herself the Lady Naomi. There were, lots of, there were lots of drag performers in the South who were called the Lady This and the Lady That <laughs> and, and, and the Lady Bunny is Lady Bunny's real, real name. She, she caught on to that because Bunny is from Chattanooga and started performing in Atlanta before she moved to New York. And she also saw there were lots of drag performers in the South who called themselves the lady so-and-so. She thought that was funny and that's why she called herself and literally at the beginning of Bunny's career it was the lady, you know, two air quotes around lady the Lady Bunny. Now she's just Lady Bunny. Mm -hmm. But the Lady Naomi was the first person I saw 
in Mississippi who called herself the lady. And she wasn't really comic actually, but she would do Pearl Bailey doing Hello Dolly because Hello Pearl Bailey did Hello Dolly on Broadway and they cut a cast recording. And so she had the whole outfit and that wasn't really comic, but she spent time on it, you know, she thought about it. And then another thing she would do in her act was she would lip sync to Gladys Knight doing, I think it was Midnight Train to Georgia. Mm -hmm. And she would get one of the chairs from the audience and she would hump it across the stage. And the audience went crazy over that okay, it's a lowbrow, but at least she was doing something that was energetic and fun. Then there was another one who was kind of a pageant queen, but she did choose a good song that always got the audience excited. She chose this famous Connie Francis song, Where the Boys Are. And of course that drove the crowd which was mainly men, in fact, probably all men, it drove them crazy because this was the safe space they had in Jackson, Mississippi, where the gay boys are, you know? Mm -hmm. So they went crazy over that. But doing that for a whole song gets kind of boring, you know? You can mm -hmm. only sing so much of that song, but she did the whole song. I began to realize at a certain point that I didn't need to do the whole song, that I could actually edit and mm -hmm. top things up. But I too started my career lip syncing to an entire song. And when I realized I could chop things up, I was doing it here in this apartment on a tape recorder, pushing the pause button. Then I started paying a guy who had a setup in his home to do reel to reel and I was happy with that. I was very happy with that. And then in the early 90s, I was doing reel to reel in a studio, a professional studio. And the engineer said, you know, we could do this on a computer. And I said, a computer? What's that? Well, how's that going to work? That doesn't sound like a good idea. Oh, I, I don't know. That sounds time consuming. And I want to keep it the way I'm doing it. So I was very reluctant. But then I started seeing what he could do because then with multiple tracks and the really fancy editing you could do at a computer. And I saw how the show could be more thematically complex. I'm sort of getting off the track of your question about do's and don'ts, but a good do is now that you can take sound and, and play with it and make it plastic, I encourage you to do that. I defy you to do it better than I do, but I, but I encourage you to do it. And I don't think I need to encourage it. I mean, I know people are trying to copy what I've done. I mean, I know that. Yeah, you really paved the way with mixing, not only just doing a full song, but cutting it up, taking audio from different places, and now that's kind of become the norm, at least in the drag scene here in New York City. You'll see performers who perform three different songs in three minutes with um, All About Eve audio, then Wizard of Oz audio. You see it all come together. And it's really, that's building off of what you did. It is. Yeah, they say I'm the OG. Do you know that term? <laughs> I do. I think it's a hip hop or a rap term, but I think it means original gangster. Oh no, somebody has said something else. Yeah, so we have, Aaron is sending us questions. I think now would be a great time to open up the floor to questions that the audience may have. So here, Aaron shares the question. For you, what is the relationship between realness and artifice in your lip sync performance? Do you strive for realness in your performance? such that your lip sync could be mistaken for singing? Yes and no. Uh, the artificial part of it is the part, one of the parts that I think is funny about it. I mean, 
I do think that lip syncing is a silly practice. I think it's an absurd practice. I think it's a, an artificial practice. I think it's theater of the artificial, if you will. And yet, I also want the audience to sometimes get so lost in it that they think, they forget that I'm lip syncing. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I like that also that they forget, but then I will also throw something into the show to remind them, oh, hey, wait a minute, this is all a joke. Do you know the name Arthur Lawrence? I know the, the name is ringing a bell. Well, the, the last name is spelled L-A-U-R-E-N-T-S, Arthur Lawrence. Arthur Lawrence wrote the book for West Side Story, the famous musical. He wrote, he wrote the book for Gypsy. Mm -hmm. he, he directed The Last Gypsy with Patti Lapone on Broadway. He came to see my show in 2000. And he and his boyfriend, they're both deceased now. They came backstage after the show. And Arthur Lawrence, we had never met. He had never seen me perform before. And he said, you know, what did he say? He said, you've got a great voice. And we all looked at him like, doesn't he know? <laughs> and the boyfriend said, Arthur, he was lip syncing. And Mr. Lawrence said, I know that. I thought he was lip syncing to himself. <laughs> but I'm not sure that he really thought I was lip syncing to myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> <sighs> wow, I, I'm, <laughs> there definitely is. And watching clips of you, I see, and of course, like I'm looking for like the technique. I'm like, oh yeah, I do this too. Let me see how others do it. But there are moments where it does feel very real. And I forget, like, wait, this is actually Joan Crawford that I'm hearing. This is not the voice of Lipsinka, the voice of John Epperson that I'm hearing at all. And then there will be the little, like, the little jaw wag that some, like, I think you throw in there a few times, other performers throw in too, that, like, it's like, oh, yeah, this is, we're seeing a lip sync here. Um, <laughs> wish I could see myself live so I could decide for myself <laughs> if I'm really fooling anybody, but that'll never happen. I'll never see myself live. There's a, so, there's a performer who said that was one of, that was his life's greatest tragedy, that he could never watch himself live. I wish I could remember who said it. But um, we have another question. Um, so this question is actually for both of us, but I'm gonna let you have the floor first. The question is, has drag contributed or changed the way you practice other art forms? Well, yes, I think it has. Um, I mentioned earlier, I think that I was, when I went into this, I knew I was hiding behind a facade, right? That I knew I was hiding behind other people's voices. I was hiding behind the makeup. I was hiding behind the drag because I, I had an enormous desire to be on stage, but a fear of being exposed, of myself being exposed. Mm -hmm. And so I created this creature that I could hide behind. And I had not had real training as an actor or as a dancer or as a singer. The only training I had ever had was as a pianist. Have we talked about that part of my life? We did a little bit how that's what you were. And when you first moved to the city, you were, um, that's what you were doing. You were being a pianist. This is my second interview today, so I don't, I don't remember what I've said and what I haven't said. Uh, so when I did my first off-Broadway show and I was doing that show 
night after night after night. I could feel my confidence growing as a person and as a performer. This was 1988 and into 89. And that was a great feeling. I felt more confident as a person. And so that then enabled me when I decided to start performing not in drag and doing roles that John Epperson was hired to do. I mm -hmm. felt more confident that way. Uh, that is one way. I have to put my glasses on to see the screen. I don't like my glasses very much. I feel like I'm Ruth Gordon in Rosemary's Baby when I put my glasses on. Uh, I was going to say something else about that. Why don't you give an answer about that, Max? Well, so drag is my main art form. And all the other art forms that I dabble in are to better serve my drag. Um, I do like, I studied a little bit of performance art in school. There was a little bit of like weird sculpture thrown in there. Um, so it definitely, drag has definitely affected the way that I do these other things. It's all in service of drag, but kind of like you touched on John, like, performing as another person hiding behind the drag um has inspired a lot more confidence in me just day to day Mas mustache or no mustache that has really the drag has really influenced the way that i walk through the world and the confidence to try other art forms too yeah yeah well um I, I remember what else I wanted to say. Uh, so I do sometimes perform a cabaret show as John Epperson. And by the way, I'm going to be doing it on October 23rd and November 6th at a place called Pangea here in the city. And everyone from Westchester who's watching is invited to come down. And I'll come to Westchester and do it too if somebody wants me. I love Westchester County, by the way. I only discovered it about 13 months ago. I think it's beautiful. And if anyone wants to invite me up, I'm available. But one thing I've realized is that when I do my John Epperson show, then that's playing a character also. I'm playing a version of John Epperson. And I'm not the only person in the world who's done that, mm -hmm. I realize late in life. And as a matter of fact, I was watching an excellent documentary on CNN that I recommend about Jackie Collins, the writer. Mm -hmm. She was a trash novelist. She was Joan, uh, Joan Collins' sister. And uh, Jackie Collins was very popular in the 80s. She wrote a famous book called Hollywood Wives, but mm. she, made, she wrote a lot of successful books, but I, I guess Hollywood Wives was the most famous. And, and they say in the documentary that she decided to put on a persona. She was gonna put on her version of Jackie Collins. And so the hair got bigger and the jewelry got bigger, the makeup got bigger. The shoulder pads got bigger, everything got bigger, and she wore it as a kind of armor. And that's what I was doing in drag, and Jackie Collins was putting on drag too. She was putting on Jackie Collins drag, like Joan Collins puts on Joan Collins drag. I think a lot of women probably have had to put on armor, and probably I was putting on drag as a, a uh, as armor, certainly, but also, I think, as because I grew up in the South, it was a way of rebelling against the repression of the South. And I, but I didn't know that at first, you know, it wasn't until years later that I figured that out. And over the years, a lot of people have said to me, Why are there so many drag performers from the South? Well, I think that's why it's a, it's a repressive place. It's, uh, I've lived now above the Mason-Dixon line for 43 years. Of course, New York is New York, that nobody cares what you do here. And I'm sure there are some repressive places in New York State, 
but it's not anything like the self. So I've gotten off the question, I think. But that's all right. If we do, a little, right. if we do a little, uh, what's it called when you? What's that writing called? The, what's the James Joyce Ulysses? That's called uh, stream of consciousness. That's oh. <laughs> But I also, I know a fair amount of drag performers from the South. And I think that rebelling against that repression, it, that's very much a driving force. Even especially, I think for performers who grew up elsewhere as well, one of the things that's so alluring about drag is being able to like explore a part of you that you were told that you couldn't or play in ways that you weren't allowed to. Um, but I see Aaron has sent me another question. Um, and it says, I think the question was addressed to me. So I'm going to go for this. It says, Max, do you see yourself as belonging to a lineage of lip sync performers? If so, where do you place yourself in that lineage? Oh, that's a good question. It's, it's funny, as we were discussing, and you mentioned Sasha, you know, Sasha Velour from, for those who don't know, she uh, was on RuPaul's Drag Race. She won her season and has now gone on to um, perform and create different shows. She's a big inspiration for me. And then Sasha says that Lipsinka was a big um, inspiration for her. So I guess that's something of a <laughs> line of inspiration. I don't know if I would call it a lineage. Um, but yeah, and it's interesting to see, I think that we're at such an interesting time in drag history where um, drag is becoming more mainstream. It's not just something that um, young adults will see at bars and be afraid of <laughs> like some of us were. Um, I think it's something that's becoming a lot more mainstream and accepted, and that's kind of making the art form evolve in different ways. And I definitely see myself as only a brief stop in history of whatever drag moves on to be next. If that makes sense. Um. <laughs> I thought of something else related to the rebelliousness of drag, mm -hmm. and that is a lot of people find drag disturbing, mm. but the double-edged sword, I guess you'd say of that is that if it wasn't disturbing, then people wouldn't be interested in it. The fact that it pushes people's buttons mm -hmm. is one of the reasons they want to see it, but it's also the one of the things that turns people off is that they find it disturbing. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I shouldn't admit this, but I, the other day I thought, I wonder what Donald Trump Jr. is saying on his Twitter page now. And so I looked at it and he has a pinned tweet at the top of his page complaining and being very sarcastic about the fact that drag performers are now performing at military bases like USO performers, I guess or like Anne Margaret used to go to Vietnam and perform for the boys, right? Uh -huh. And he's, Donald Trump Jr. is complaining about that and, he, and being very sarcastic about it. Mm -hmm. And so I posted it on my Facebook page and I said, well, it was bound to happen, you know, that <laughs> this guy would be sarcastic about this, and that, but people jumped all over him and said, but, but men who were stuck on military bases in World War II in Europe, they got in drag to entertain one another. Mm -hmm. And they were in on the joke. Because Trump Jr. was saying that it, he feels like it makes us look weak, that it makes our military look weak that someone from RuPaul's drag race may have performed at a military base. Uh, 
I feel like all I can do is raise my eyebrows at that. I actually, and that must have been why I saw it on Twitter, but images were going around of um, um, of drag performers on military bases. Um, I mean, um, uh, military personnel dressing in drag. That must have been why I saw it. Now I understand the context. There's another question here, and I think this will have to be our last. Um, so our final question, um, John, did you make your own costumes when you first got started in drag? And what about your wigs? I wish that I knew how to make costumes and wigs. I don't. My wigs have always been purchased or given to me. And uh, one of the one of the ways one of the safe ways of getting in drag in Mississippi, not long before I left there, was to go to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show in drag. And uh, we did do that. And uh, but it took a couple of years for that movie to ever even get to Jackson, Mississippi. I did have a, a costume made for me, but I didn't make it. I do not know, know how to sew or anything like that. I wish I did. It would have been great if I could have made my own stuff, but I can't. Yeah, I no, I'm the same way. And then after I got here, you know, I bought stuff at thrift shops. That's how I found stuff. And then around 1987, a guy who died of AIDS, a guy named Anthony Wong, expressed interest in making stuff for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been with American Ballet Theater to Japan. And on my own, I went to Hong Kong. This was in 1984. And I bought a bunch of fabric in Hong Kong. And uh, so it was three years later when I met him and he expressed interest in making stuff. I said, oh, great. I have this fantastic black lace that I bought in Hong Kong. And it became one of my first costumes from my first off-Broadway show. And I think Anthony died in 93 or 94. Mm -hmm. And then I met other people who have designed and made stuff for me. So now it is custom made. Mm -hmm. The stuff that you that I've bought in thrift shops, it never really fit because it's made for women and I am not a woman. I am a man and I don't have the female body type. And even when you showed that clip of me in Terry Mugler's show, that show was first done in Paris in 1991. And he called me about two weeks before the show. And he said, we have realized that you are not the same size as one of our fitting models. And we need you to come here immediately and have a fitting. So I jumped on a plane to Paris two weeks before the show and stood there for hours for a fitting for that outfit. Well, it looked incredible. It was made to fit me and only me, and it does not belong to me. It is a it is museum quality. It will end up in a some kind of museum someday. Mm -hmm. um, as I think a lot of drag will end up, or similar drag items, they'll become artifacts, museum pieces. Well, people are already asking for my archive. They. There's, a comp there's an organization in the South that wants my costumes. I've given them one already. Hey, Arts Westchester, if you want to start a costume collection, you know who to turn to. <laughs> Aaron. And there, and there they are. <laughs> it's a uh, John, I was just going to say, um, yeah, it would be wonderful to, to also maybe have an exhibition of of some of your costumes along with your own personal narrative uh, about those pieces and when you wore them and how they came to be. And anyway, sorry to just jump in here and interrupt, but I got really excited. So. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'm building my archive in my storage space and you're welcome to come and see it.
I'm going there tomorrow at 1230 if you want to join us. <laughs> so I think on that note, we'll put our conversation to an end here. Um, I'm John, thank you so much for joining me for, with this conversation. Thank you. Thank you to our writer. Oh yeah, of course. And thank you to everybody watching on Facebook. Thank you, Arts Westchester. Thank you, The Loft. Um, and happy Pride Month to everybody. Aaron, Scott, I don't know if you want to say any last words before we end. Or John, do you have any last words? Only that I hope people were watching. I recently saw Jackie Hoffman do something for concert on Broadway World with Seth Rudetsky. And every once in a while, the two of them would say, oh, nobody's watching this. It doesn't matter what we say or what we do. Nobody's watching. So I hope people are watching. We did get a few questions. Yeah, so, so I think you know, at least three people were watching, right? Yes, exactly. OK, so um, I guess I'll, I'll end it. Yeah, we definitely have. Uh, we, we've had an audience throughout. and. Um, uh, as closing, I don't know how you both feel about this, but uh, we can pull up one of uh, John's uh, videos, um, uh, performance of, of Lip Synca, and maybe close with that. It's fine with me. Um, you have, sure. Do you have a preference? We have the trilogy and wig stock, and Lip Synca must be destroyed. The lip meets Barbara. Well, that, that wig stock clip is the, one of the most recent things on YouTube. I think it's from... It's the revival of Wigstock in 2018, if you want to show that. Sure thing. And we'll end after that. Thank you both so much for being welcome. here. welcome. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Max. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>